the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Only moments ago, we heard the first two verses in the Gospel reading for this day from the book of Matthew, chapter 6, chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Mm. That should serve as both a comfort and a warning to each of us who are Orthodox Christians. The only way to heaven for us believers in Jesus Christ as our Lord God and Savior, Jesus Christ, is living a Christian life of faith, hope, love and virtue, and specifically mutual forgiveness. One of the features that first attracted me to orthodoxy when I was a graduate student in search of a new Christian faith was a magnificent custom in Russia and other historically orthodox churches or nations. Before the beginning of Great Lent, every year, when each orthodox Christian went to all of his or her friends, neighbors, and relatives with whom he had any personal differences during the past year and asked their forgiveness. In return, they would do likewise. I was so impressed by that act of humility, and I still am 50 years later, that I began to think seriously about the beauty and integrity of the Orthodox Christian lifestyle and tradition. Then, within a year after my conversion in October 1975, I finally began to read the great works of world literature by the Russian novelist Fyodor Dostoevsky. Just a quick question. Has anybody read anything from Fyodor Dostoevsky? If you have, raise your hands. I'm delighted. <coughs> I discovered the full meaning and reason <coughs> for the remarkable practice of asking forgiveness in his last great novel, Brothers Karamazov. This humble, universal practice of asking forgiveness at least once a year. In a turning point, halfway through that typically very long novel, The Brothers Karamazov, the young idealistic monk Alyosha has a mystical but wrenching moment after experiencing the shocking, horrible, unexpected stench that exuded from the dead body of his beloved spiritual teacher to start at Sosima in the monastery chapel. Dostoevsky tells us, Alyosha bolts from the chapel and runs frantically into the woods. Here is how he describes Dostoevsky what happens next. Alyosha stood gazed and suddenly threw himself down onto the earth. He did not know why he embraced it. He could not have told why he longed so irresistibly to kiss it, to kiss it all. But he kissed it, weeping and sobbing and watering it with his tears and vowed passionately to love it, to love it forever and ever. Water the earth with your tears of joy and love those tears echo in his soul. What was he weeping over? Oh, in his rapture. He was weeping even after, oh, for all the, all the stars which were shining to him from the abyss of space. And he was not ashamed of that ecstasy. There seemed to be threads of all those innumerable, innumerable worlds of God linking his soul to them and his soul was trembling all over in contact with other worlds. He longed to forgive everyone and for everything and to beg forgiveness, oh, not for himself, but for all men and for all and everything. And others are praying for me too, echoed again in his soul. But with every instant, he felt clearly and as it were, tangibly, that something firm and unshakable in that vault of heaven had entered into his soul. 
It was as though some idea had seized the sovereignty of his mind and it was for all his life and forever and ever. He had fallen on the earth, a weak boy, but he rose up, a resolute champion, and he knew and felt it suddenly at that very moment of his ecstasy. And never, never, all his life long, could Alyosha forget that minute. What a, what a magnificent expression. To ask forgiveness from everyone and to forgive everyone. Fyodor Dostoevsky knew his Bible well. That couplet captured the majesty and joy that our Lord knows awaits his faithful followers who practice what he preached, what he lived, all the way to the cross. We are all of us human beings connected spiritually. You ever, ever thought of that? We are all somehow connected. Not just because we're human beings, but, we, but as, as persons created in the image and likeness of God. We're connected even organically, each of us with one another, and even mystically with the entire universe. We never do anything in isolation. But what affects us as human brothers and sisters, and what affects each of us then, what affects each of us affects them too. All we can do of any lasting value in this world of sin is to forgive one another. And that means everyone without exception. Forgiveness for our own offenses, weaknesses, and sins. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what kind of world we would have if the movers and shakers in this fallen world took to heart our Lord's gospel, especially as interpreted by the great Theodor Dostoevsky. Well, one remarkable historical mover and shaker did precisely that. In his second inaugural address as President of the United States on March 4, 1865, only a month before the surrender of Confederate General Robert E. Lee to Union General Ulysses S. Grant, at Appomattox Courthouse here in Virginia on April 9, 1865, Abraham Lincoln said these, I would say, divinely inspired words. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which we may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and all nations. Alas, as all of us Americans know too well, that magnificent deed did not go unpunished, as it were. On April 14, 1865, President Lincoln was assassinated in Washington, D.C. by John Wilkes Booth. And with his sudden, shocking, undeserved death, Lincoln's dream and vision of a, of a reunited, virtuous American people died a premature death. But you say, Father, how can we forgive murderers, terrorists, self-righteous fanatics, vicious abusers of other people, self-seeking politicians, disloyal friends, traitors, and so on. How can we overcome our own personal feelings of outrage, disgust, bitterness, betrayal, or extreme disappointment? And I say, holy forgiveness, as our Lord himself taught and lived and died, has little or nothing to do with our personal feelings. A year ago, my esteemed uh, fellow Orthodox priest and friend, Father Patrick Henry Reardon, Antiochian priest in the Chicago area, retired, he shared these brilliant thoughts in an article in Touchstone magazine titled, Loving Our Enemies. He wrote, we are burdened with a deep modern bias that takes feelings as the valid test of what is real. Thus we judge those things to be most genuine 
that we feel most deeply, as though spontaneity creates authenticity. Consequently, when duty, even divinely imposed duty, obliges us to do things we do not necessarily feel, the current culture disposes us to regard ourselves as phony and insincere. This is surely nonsense. Doing good to our enemies is of a piece, of course, with forgiving them, a thing that Lord, the Lord repeatedly commands. Once again, it is important to observe exactly the nature of the mandate. We are not enjoined to feel forgiveness. God seems not the least bit concerned with how we feel on the subject of our enemies. In this case, too, it may happen that the cultivated habit of forgiving our enemies may actually lead down the road to subjective sentiments of forgiveness. Well and fine. But it is the act, not the feeling, which is commanded. To be sure, this is not an easy concept and practice to grasp and to adopt as our own way of life. I still recall vividly the first time my own mother, Eileen Dorothy Nay Gallagher Webster, said something that I, about six or seven year old boy in Jersey City, New Jersey, thought was downright senseless and stupid. After she disciplined me with a short spanking, it was the 1950s after all, short spanking, for excessively teasing my younger sister and causing her to cry after previous warnings not to do so, my mother said, Freddie, that was my nickname among my family and friends, please do not call me that name ever. <laughs> not even Father Freddie. <laughs> she said, Freddie, I may, not, I may not always like you, but I always love you. <clears throat> Let that sink in a moment. I'm going to say it again. I may not always like you, but I always love you. Only years later did I, when I had children, I understand and finally appreciate what she meant. By the way, does my mother's unexpected wisdom also make sense to you all? How many of you as parents have said that? Anybody? Isn't it amazing? It must be an American thing. Or an Irish, Scottish, well, American. You know. In a mysterious way, my own beloved mother had practically the same insight as Father Patrick Henry Reardon, an accomplished scholar, 65 years later. She knew that both love and forgiveness are much deeper, profound, meaningful and desirable than how we may merely feel about someone in a particular moment or even in general. When and how then may we know that we are practicing forgiveness the Jesus way? The great church father, St. John Climacus in his Ladder of Divine Ascent in sixth century Sinai, Egypt, <clears throat> wrote powerfully about the human foible of remembrance of wrongs, remembrance of wrongs, especially against us by others who, who we may resent and are not inclined to forgive, referring to the remembrance of wrongs as rot, R-O-T, rot, or moral and spiritual decay, he offered this pearl of wisdom. You will know that you have completely freed yourself of this rot, not when you pray for the person who has offended you, nor when you exchange presents with him, nor when you invite him to your table, but only when, on hearing that he has fallen into spiritual or bodily misfortune, you suffer for him as for yourself. Do we weep? for those who have offended us? Or are we too busy weeping for ourselves? Do we at least forgive them quietly and sincerely in our hearts? Have we asked their forgiveness for any offense, real or unintended, that we may have visited upon them? 
If the answer to any of those questions is no, then what are we waiting for? The time for forgiveness is always the same. In addition to Forgiveness Sunday today, our regularly scheduled Holy Confessions with clergy, there is no respectable reason to delay and not act diligently and swiftly. The time for forgiveness, my brothers and sisters in Christ, is now, or at least as soon as we can reasonably do so. We're going to have a ceremony today, a nice little ritual, where we ask forgiveness of each other. Don't let it stop here. We need to go home. If there's anyone that you need to ask forgiveness for, don't hesitate. And even people you think may not be worthy of your forgiveness, ask them as well. The time for forgiveness is now. Amen.